1190 AM, NBC News, and the best in specialty programming. The views and opinions expressed on this program are not necessarily those of this station or Clear Channel Communications. Welcome to the Automotive News and Entertainment Show with your host, Jim Proctor. For the next hour, automotive news, reviews, and celebrity interviews. And now, here's your host, Jim Proctor. Good morning, North Texas, and welcome to another edition of the A&E Show right here on 1190KFXR. I am joined this morning by the normal crew with Joel the Gorilla. What up? We have the shoe. Good morning. We have the guru, Josh Deaton. Good morning. I'm going to do a shout out for the oh, first you're time. Me, oh, Josh. Here oh, this is here a, we go. Hey, this yeah. is a special one. This one's very special. My wife and I have been married for 16 years come this one this month. Congratulations, and, uh, Amy. The Golf best, clap. most beautiful wife on the planet. Congratulations. God bless that woman. And then we've got the uh, spin doctor, James Schaefer. And I'm going to do the normal shout-out. Shout-out to that Rockwall High School softball team as they head out to the playoffs. And my daughter's favorite player, Alyssa Henry, sophomore sensation. Oh, fantastic. Um, good morning, guys. And, um, hey, listen, first thing we wanted to start off with is because, I mean, we got a lot of tweets and a lot of comments from people on uh, – on Facebook and Twitter for for days after last week's show. And so there were a few things from last week's show with Kinky Friedman that we wanted to talk about and some things that, you know, maybe we wanted to go into a little bit of detail just for a few minutes and kind of clear up uh, some of the scenarios that we're talking about as far as his view on on legalizing pot, hemp, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, um, and how it's used in different situations. And I know, Josh, you had some uh, some stuff you wanted to talk about on that. Yeah, love the guy. Um, you know, I was fully prepared to have my guard up when first meeting Kinky. And once you sit down with him, he is actually a very cool guy to be around. He's a very nice guy, um, very personable. And, you know, it's just it was hard to, to not like the guy in the first place. Um, we had we had a lot of topics that we talked about on the last segment on the last uh, show, and uh, some of them a little bit controversial. I mean, he, everything was that he's trying to push is about the marijuana, and um, you know he's obviously he smoked pot with Willie Nelson and and everything else. But his big push is uh, for the medicinal purposes of utilizing the marijuana for. Um, the stuff that you can make with the, there's thousands and thousands of things that you can make with the, with uh, with hemp with uh, so he what did he say hemp crete you can make concrete which is apparently yeah. stronger than regular concrete but you know where where kinky's I mean you you can go on two paths here one is you can talk about the hemp and and to be honest I didn't know the difference between hemp and pot you know as I, as you and I were talking about um, and could care less to be honest I mean if there's medical use for it that's great one of the things though with kinky's whole campaign is he and, and maybe it's his fault maybe it's not maybe it's his campaign i mean i don't care but when you take a platform and you just want to talk about pot the media is going to pick it up and and talk about why we should uh should or should not legalize it and where and, and that's a, that's a mistake on that. I mean, Kinky has he's in Texas. We're a conservative state, and um, I'm sorry, the Tea Party's out there. They're not they're not going to support it, and and that's just the fact. So it's he if he wants to win, then he's going to have to end up appealing to the right, and he's going to have to end up changing his campaign where it's not all about pot smoking and it is about the medical use and uh, of marijuana and I, I agree there there's a lot of great uses for it as I've as I've read as I've been educated on it a little bit but the his message is not being received correctly correct well, and I, uh, yeah the I mean you look at what the media ha has pushed with it I mean you know one of the biggest things that he talked about, is you know the the uses for cancer patients and and things of that nature and one of the things he spoke of was you know you have the opportunity to if you were able to legalize this in some form whether it's just for you know medical purposes or what have you I mean you could literally he's talking about having the largest cancer center in the country um, you know using this stuff 
for treatment. And I think that there's really three different, three or four different levels to dealing with marijuana. I think, you know, you have the medical portion of it. Then you have what some areas and states and stuff have done as opposed to legalizing it, which is the decriminalization of it. And then, of course, you have the states that, you know, have legalized it. And there were some listeners who, I mean, some points that we were aware of and some listeners brought up, you know, about the banks and FDIC insuring, you know, money that's brought in from from marijuana or pot or hemp, which technically in this country as a whole is illegal. So you're having issues with, you know, protecting this money. How do you, And I know I, my understanding now, and like you said, doing some research on it, is these states are having real issues about how to handle this money. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that have to be worked, worked through with it. You know, the stuff that I've looked at and I've read from, you know, like I said, from a medical standpoint, cancer treatments, you know, the ability to reduce or even get rid of, of, of seizures, I think that that's the first step, and I have absolutely no problem. I'm be 100% behind doing it that way. Um, you know, but that wasn't the only that wasn't the only controversial thing that that he carried on his campaign. I mean, it, you know, it's the gay marriage deal, yeah. which you know, going back to '06 when he ran for governor, I mean, that was you know he put that on his platform. You know, they have the right to be just as miserable as the rest of us. You know, that was kind of a campaign <laughs> slogan that he used. And, you know, that's another controversial topic. That's coming. That, that, that is, you know, whether it goes through the court uh, in, uh, I think it's going to go through the court in Louisiana, in New Orleans. Um, God, that's a whole nother subject right there, Governor Yeah, that, but I mean, it, it, that stuff's, <laughs> you know, that stuff's going to happen. And I mean, I think that, you know, yeah, you're right, uh, Josh. I mean, you talked about, you know, you sit and you spend the time and we had the opportunity, you know, before the show, during, after the show, spend time with the guy. And when you do it that way, um, I mean, you can't help but like the guy, but the guy has no filter. I mean, yeah, he just no says, I mean, he says what is on his mind. Now, to a certain point, to me, for someone who's running for a political office, that's kind of refreshing. Because how many times have we seen somebody run for office based on some platform? And then the minute they get in office, flip flop because they didn't really believe in it anyway. One thing right. I don't, you know, and, yeah, and, and, so I, I respect the fact that he comes out full force, yep. straight ahead. Whether agree. you agree with what he's saying or not is a different story. But the fact of the matter is, is that he just he is just telling it like it is. Now they're his personal views, they're his personal opinion. He does have backers on all this stuff. He does have people who support all this stuff. But you know, one of the other things talking about hemp or marijuana or what have you and all the other uses, you know, from the medical to the, you know, hemp creed or whatever it is, yeah. you know, you're talking about he, and he brought this up, he, he, a very small piece of it, but he brought it up about the Texas farmers, the Texas farmers who have had such a hard time because of the droughts, the lack of water and everything else trying to grow anything. Well, it takes a very, very minimal amount of water to grow pot, to grow hemp. You could actually put these farmers back to work as long as the government's handling it, as long as the state's handling it, you know, you could actually put them back to work. I mean, you can actually create jobs from it, even if you only use it on the on the medical side. So that part of it, I support 100 percent. I think there's too many questions about the decriminalization and the full legalization to jump into that right away. I think there's too many things that have to be handled long before you could do that. And I think, you know, Colorado and Washington State are perfect examples. I mean, I don't think they were prepared for for what happened. Well, and then, then so his biggest push too is okay. Let's go ahead and legalize it here in Texas, and we'll put it to education. Well, you we're all old enough to remember when we started bringing in the lotto tickets, and that was supposed to fund education too. And how's that working out for us? Right. You know, it, it's not. And so I, I think just, I mean, a, as a society, we're jaded. We're, we're giving all these promises from all these politicians. And the bottom line is a lot of these politicians, they're getting up, they, they make their money or they get their backers or whatever, and then they get into office. And they're exactly what Kinky said. They're empty suits. And, you know, I, I'm a political science major and wanted to get into politics. And, and honestly, I'm disgusted with it. Yeah, it, it, it's a sad thing, but I am one one thing. Just like you said, he has no filter, and you know, honestly, I kind of like it, just like you, 
Jim. You know, it, it is refreshing to have someone that's not fake go in there. And what did he say? They need the, the prison systems need to make more room for the <laughs> for, real bad people, for the pedophiles, pedophiles and, and politicians. politicians. Right. You know, so, I mean. It, Which it, is worse. And then listening to him when he's. And I understand he's trying to make a push for medicinal purposes and, and hemp and things like that that you can make. You think but Willie's in his back pocket? It's just <laughs> on the show he says he says uh, that he, Willie Nelson, after smoking a joint with him, <laughs> jumps up and kicks a jumps up six foot in the air and kicks a bean or what is it a punching bag in the top. <laughs> it was probably like, was well, a bean bag. Yeah, well he was probably high on the on the weed, but you know. <laughs> Or Willie Nelson just didn't know his limitations, you know, because he was so high. <laughs> so uh, he broke broke his hip and didn't yeah, even he's know like, it. I'm a ninja, you know. So I don't know, but I I really like Kinky, and I think he stands for it. what he says he's going to try to do. I think he he will actually go after. You like it. Kinky and as a person. You I don't like, like all of his politics, but you you like him as a person, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he and was it a is fun nice guy. To have someone that says I'm going to do this, and I really think. He would go in there and and push for whatever he says. So that is refreshing. Yeah, I, th I think he would push. Do I think he'd get anything accomplished? No, I really don't. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think so either. But like you said, it is refreshing to have somebody in there like that. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to break. And next up, right here on the A and E show, we're gonna talk about where we were a hundred years ago and where we're gonna be a hundred years from now. I right here born. on eleven ninety KFXR. You're listening to the Automotive News and Entertainment Show, right here on 1190 AM. Welcome back to the A&E Show, right here on 1190. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and Twitter at the A&E Show. And also check out our website at theaneshow.com. Uh, right now, what we want to talk about is uh, where we were 100 years ago and where we're going to be 100 years from now. Well... <clears throat> to kind of lead into this, the, the NHTSA mandates backup cameras in all vehicles built after May 2018. And, and it just kind of amazed me where um, technology is going and, and where it's come so far. So looking back 100 years ago, uh, people were still riding horses. You know, they honestly, they were riding horses 100 years ago. So when they had to back up... Did, did they have did, backup sensors? Well, yeah, did they <laughs> did they have to turn their head? You know, I mean, can we not turn our head anymore? <laughs> no, I, James, I think they had to turn their head. I don't think they had mirrors or backup sensors. Now, so, 100 years ago you could turn around and look behind you, but now? No, you can't yeah, do you it. Yeah, you can't do it. Can you imagine parallel parking a horse? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Silver. <laughs> Well, by 1910, many <laughs> suburban homes had been wired with power and new electric gadgets were being patented. And some of these were the vacuum cleaners and washing, wash, washing well, machines had just become commercially available, though were still too expensive for the middle class families. So you just started washing machines just started coming around. Vacuum cleaners just started coming around. Um, you know, so. To kind of see where we are now, that's an everyday use. So well, not, well, not all the time. It, de yeah. it depends. My, my, my kids still have no have clue. To be plugged in, <laughs> turned on, and used. Pulled, they, out, pulled James, out of the closet. James still walks <laughs> yeah. down to the creek and scrubs his underwear on a rock. So. Yeah. After a week, you know, <laughs> a good it's week, a, and then it's it that Sunday fine. thing. <laughs> no, I mean, but you talked on it. I mean, you know, the middle class couldn't afford it. I mean, it, it's really just like anything else. Normally, as far as you know, when technology comes out, I mean, you know, usually the price point on it is so high. You know, it's the rich and famous and beautiful people like Paul South and the coolest yeah. guy in Dallas <laughs> yeah. who can actually afford something like that. Um, <laughs> and then what else? You had the uh, the telephone was the hot new thing. Yeah, most homes were connected by manual switchboards at that time. So if you had a cell phone. Uh, or not a cell phone. Yeah, was, uh, if you had a phone, <laughs> you were able. That's how you were able to actually communicate current events and news and things like that. Otherwise, you'd have to read the paper. So, well, um, you'll but see it's just, a lot of that, like in old movies. You'll see mm -hmm. when they make a phone call and they're actually calling the operator and saying, you know, connect me to, you know, whatever it is, yeah. five four three, mm -hmm. and you see her pulling the plug and you know and plugging it in. So it's completely manual. Yeah, yep. my mother in law did that for thirty five years with AT and well. Ma Bell or whatever it was called at the time. Bell yeah. Telephone. Bell I Telephone, yeah. Called. Did you know that Alexander Graham Bell did not want the original phone green to be hello? He wanted to be ahoy? 
Ahoy. Ahoy. That's, Ahoy. that's now, where did I'm... you pick that up from? Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's where you get your education. Hey, nice. That, no, I read something. That everything they, they talk about, it's, they, they research it, and it's factual. It's facts. Everything they say is factual on that. Well, science related. Oh, is that okay, because I, I was going to say. <laughs> it's on the internet. It's real. Of course, you had the Wright Brothers historic flight. Yeah, the Kitty Hawk in 1903. Uh, the radio technology was still in its infancy. Uh, regular broadcasts were still several years away. So if you want, you may have had a radio, but uh, you couldn't listen to the. You A&E couldn't show. listen to it. You got to look at it. Um, but it's just you know, just seeing seeing how technology and how fast it comes. Well, didn't they have is, television in the 30s? Or well, 30s you, you're or the only 40s? one that would know that shoe. You tell us. Well, no, it's what I'm saying, <laughs> but it was, it was using some kind of disc or something or another to to block the motion, to give it the motion or something like this. But it was real tough. I mean, it's something on Discovery. I mean, look, channel. all I can remember is whenever <laughs> I was growing up, we had channel two through thirteen. Channel two was HBO fuzzed out, and I had to go to my neighbors whenever I would see that Clash of the Titans was on. I'd have to go to my neighbors because he had HBO. You remember those remotes, the big remotes that you, that used to have like the yeah. huge buttons that yeah. poke out, yeah, and when you were, push it, it sounded like an air compressor. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> <laughs> when you push it, it's like. And they, I think they were like brass looking and with black. And it's just crazy. Oh, you guys need to grow up in Kansas. I was the remote. <laughs> yeah. we, had, we had two That's why, channels. Why the parents had kids. <laughs> um, all right. So Henry Ford introduced his landmark Model T in 1908, making automobiles available and affordable to the masses for the very first time. And uh, in 1910, advances to the use of gas chilled the world out of basically refrigerators and using electricity for for cooling things so um air conditioners and refrigerators were were just brought around in 1910. my great uncle was an ice man i, I yeah, was gonna well, say I mean, you had i mean you had technically before the electronic plug-in you know refrigerator they actually had yeah. refri- refrigerators yeah. so what boxes. you had to do you had the ice man mm-hmm. who would bring you a huge block of ice and you would put it it's almost like today's cooler it's like it was like a giant igloo cooler I mean, you put the ice in there, and then you'd put, mm-hmm. you know, the rest of your perishable items in there, and the ice would keep it co- would keep it cool. You know, the issue was is that eventually the ice would melt, and you'd have to keep, you know, he'd come by what every come, day and come by every couple of days or something yeah, like and bring that. You a, a, a big, but think of, you know, think of the size of these guys that were doing that because those huge blocks of ice that they were carrying off those trucks. It'd be 150, 200 yeah. pounds, I would yeah. say. And well, they, easy. Di- didn't they have the ice? Uh, coolers in the car so when the first the ac came out so you're driving you know you're 20 miles away or whatever well they're doing that in nascar you're getting that confused no 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 <laughs> I, th- I think i'm right about this they, they put the ice block in there it'd blow on you and by the time you get to your destination you're soaking wet <laughs> in I the ice i think that's a true that's a true f- i guess well, my i gotta look at the big on. bang well, theory. think about think about trying to having to do that in the winter oh you know, Especially up north, it. something like that, right. you know, trying to c- c- carry that stuff up the stairs and mm-hmm. so on. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, escalators, kind of tea bags, and disposable razor blades were just invented as well, as well as the zipper, which, as you know, that changed uh, the way people put on their clothes. They didn't have to just tie them up anymore. They could just zip. Very they easy. Buttons. Yeah, oh, they, they, they could well, use I'm buttons, too. I'm buttons now. But what happens when you <laughs> get fat? You don't have the you chance to buttons. suck it in. <laughs> You don't get a chance to lay on the bed and try to suck it all in and zip it up. <laughs> Josh, you never had to worry about that. I don't no. even know why you're even bringing that up. You know, my, my, I've seen it on TV. My <laughs> great uncle tells a story of back uh, in the 50s, or I guess it was probably the 40s, I guess when they first started putting radios in cars. It, of course, they were made out of tubes, you know, the old tube technology. Yeah. Right? You didn't dare turn the engine of your car off and play the radio with your date. Because your car wasn't going to start, they'd suck so much juice. <laughs> it's crazy. That's you know, if you think about it, the 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 record is was the big thing. The record, and then it goes to the the eight, eight track, track, and then you got the cassette player. Then you've got the D DV- or the CD player, which you know. How when many I of y'all ever made yeah. a mixtape for your girlfriend? Bam. Yeah, there you yeah, go, right on. Joel. Right. Or had yeah, vanilla I mean, ice. Yeah. You, the, you what is it? <laughs> so you could have vanilla ice and you can listen it over and over again? Well, I mean, but, you know, you think about this. I mean, you're talking about records. You're talking about vinyl. Then, like you said, you're talking about the 8-track the tape player, cassettes, 
you know, then MP3, CDs. Yeah, CDs well, and now, MP4s. And now you're seeing, I mean, now a lot of the automobiles that are being built, they don't have CD players. They don't have Ooh, anything. Right. Everything is, you know, it's like a your Bluetooth. Your, well, yeah, your sound your system phone. is like a giant iPod. Yeah, you know, iPod, iPad. You know, it could basically right. do, you know, basically do everything. Just when you think you've hit the wall and you can't go any further, I mean, what could what could possibly be next on top of that? Honestly, I mean, think about it. You when the DV, when the CDs come out, you're that was big. Yeah. You know, you got music coming off of this this yes. disc. You know. And uh, but now you've got it all streaming from your phone. It's just it's amazing, you know. And and this all this was happened within a hundred years. And um, you know it's exciting because we've got some futurists uh, talking about you know where we're going to be a hundred years from now. So well, yeah, and I, the, the the first one we were talking about is the nano robots. It'll be flying around inside your body, fixing cells, and able to record your memories. And Joel, you and might have some like trouble that. with that. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he's going to be – I mean, he's a gorilla, so uh, tep- t- typically he would be the test monkey. I wonder, I, I, wonder if, my, yeah. I wonder if they can erase memories like when mullets were cool. I don't want and, my uh, memories restored. No. Yeah, I don't, no. I don't think all the technology in the world could oh, restore no. some of your memories. No. And I don't think – the public is ready to hear some of those mm. memories. Yeah, that could be true too. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about how about this one? How about space elevators? Yeah, space elevators is supposed to be a uh, uh, cheap and easy travel for. Uh, but it, it, they say cheap and easy. I don't know how cheap and easy that will actually be. But I want one in my living room. Where and, do uh, these space elevators go? Um, um, Josh space? has some. They go into. I understand yeah, they go they, to. Space, but it's kind of a big place. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so <laughs> just kind of puts you out there and you float around for a little bit. Can you, can and you, you grab the elevator. Yeah, you're imagine. in orbit. You're in orbit. What if one of those things, what if like the cable snaps or something? Well, that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the only part I would worry Obviously, about. Obviously, it's not going to be my cable. OCD. <laughs> Obviously, it's not going to be cable. But I mean, think about this. Get this mental picture in your head. Okay, you're on the, you know, the space station or you're, and you're, you're looking down at space and you see all these little, Things poking out all over the world. <laughs> yeah, these space elevators. I mean, you got to be kidding me. No, I mean, the, this there is, is no way in hell. This <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they, they give hell. a rating on this. They give a rating on this that says that seven out of ten chance this could happen. Most a lot of these facts. I took the highest factual possibilities. Did you get all this from those. the Big Bang Theory? No, he got it from the internet where it's real. Yeah, no, the, well, it's <laughs> fact if it's on the on the internet. <laughs> So these space elevators, if, uh, you know, I don't know how expensive that'll be, but I would like to have one in my living room. Kind and like uh, highways to nowhere. Delivery it, Max needs that. Yeah, delivery. So when people, if we're mad at someone, we invite them to come <laughs> yeah, over. Go to a space like, elevator. Yeah, come over, and I got this <laughs> elevator that goes into space. So if you want to take a ride, and then we send them into orbit. And then when people come over to our house, they're like, why do you have so many cables in your living room? And then we're like, oh, don't worry about it. You want to ride in my space elevator? Yeah, well, I guarantee you none of us are going to live long enough to see that. All right, we're going to take a break right here, and we're going to come back with the coolest guy in Dallas, Paul Southen, who happens to be in L.A. We're going to talk about Kevin Cosner and Jennifer Gardner's new movie, Draft Day, right here on 1190 KFXR. You're tuned in to the Automotive News and Entertainment Show right here on 1190 AM. Welcome back to the A&E Show. And next up, we're going to have Paul Southen calling in live from L.A. Paul, you with us? I'm with you. All right, Paul. How you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm like uh, Joel the Gorilla over here. I'm, I'm tapping the uh, computer with my knuckles trying to get it to work. <laughs> Uh, I'm, well, I'm glad he said tapping the computer with his knuckles. <laughs> I didn't know where that was going to go. Well, Paul. we're just we're just uh, we're just glad you were able to join us after a long night of partying. Did you did you just go to bed a little bit ago? Uh, no, actually, I, I uh, was fairly well behaved. Well, that's a first. <laughs> um, I actually the last couple of times I've come here, I've just uh, you know been in and out for work. But you know the thing is, when I come out here, I'm doing. TV interviews, so I got in last night and, you know, come back today. It's a quick thing. But when you're here to do interviews, I kind of notice that I look a little tired when I go out too late. So uh, try not to do that. Oh, good. Hey, uh, anyway, what we wanted to, you know, talk about was your uh, interview with Kevin Cosner and uh, the uh, movie with him and Jennifer Garner, uh, Draft Day, which uh, 
I actually had the opportunity to go see yesterday, and I thought it was a I thought it was a pretty interesting movie. Um, you know, for especially for anybody who's an NFL fan. I mean, it's not an NFL movie. It kind of more focuses on a lot of things on the backside of, uh, you know, with the GMs and and things of that nature. Yeah, I, I thought that's what was really interesting about it because, you know, I, I didn't even really understand some of the intricacies of of that kind of thing. So uh, it was really interesting to see that, but also for it to be a sports movie without ever having ever showed any actual sports happen. So it was kind of cool. And Kevin Costner is just so good. You know, I I think I told him in the beginning of the the interview, you are the king of great sports movies. And he really is. I mean, and I think he's honestly actually gotten a little better with age. Yeah, I, you know, I like to go to movies, especially, you know, a movie like this. And uh, I come out and I'll think, you know, who else could have been playing that leading role? And to be honest with you, I couldn't come up with another name. I couldn't come up with another person who I thought could have really pulled that role off, you know, because he's, you know, uh, he's fighting between, you know, some things that have gone on in his personal life and then, you know, this the professional deal being the, you know, the general manager of the Cleveland Browns and, and trying to revamp that team, you know, from the, you know, from the ashes and, and so I really couldn't come up with anybody else that I thought could have pulled that part off the way he did. Yeah, totally. He's, he's got the confidence to have that kind of position, but he also he's likable enough to where he can totally carry it. And what a great supporting cast, too, right? I mean, Jennifer Garner, of course, is always uh, lovely. And then, you know, Frank Langella. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, just actually everyone in there was really, really solid and you know, directed by Ivan Reitman, who brought us some of our favorite films from the 80s. So it was, uh, it was cool. It, was, it almost played out like a chess match. Well, let's listen to the uh, interview with uh, Kevin Cosner. Uh, Kevin okay. Cosner and the coolest guy in Dallas, Paul Salfin. Well, congratulations on the film. You're the, the king of great sports films. <laughs> <laughs> I, it came out really good. I, well, that was my hope. I, I thought it could be the equivalent to some of the movies that people have really liked, and it really was. Draft Day came out just perfect. And you're a big sports fan yourself, right? Yeah, I do. I do. I've, I have a tendency to follow, you know, basketball, baseball, and football. Yeah, so who's your favorite team football-wise? Well, football, it, it's, once we lost the team in Los Angeles, I've been forced to just watch who's playing well. I haven't really adopted a team uh, because if they're not playing well and they're not really my team, I, I want to watch who else is playing. So I, I like as a season winds down, and I'm going to really focus in on who's playing well. I'm not going to watch a team that's 4-12. and 12. It doesn't matter to me. Jennifer was just telling me about a, a great moment on the set where you did a nine pages of dialogue all at once, and there's a big round of applause at the end. What do you think is a special moment that you'll always remember from the set? Well. When actors do that, in, you know, without um, telling you they're going to do that, that's a that's a little private thing, and it's kind of a cool moment. I even forgot about it until you just told me, and and uh, that's a there's a we're a community that that there were we're our own team, and I think they understood how difficult it was, how many different things were actually going on uh, that that I had to kind of key off of, and and so. It's nice that she would relay that story. Now, on the Drew Pearson Show, we always ask people their Hail Mary moment. You know, Drew famously caught the Hail Mary pass, and everyone has a Hail Mary moment in their in their career where they just kind of had to go for it and it worked out for them. What do you suppose that was for you? Well, I've jumped off a cliff three or four times, you know, with Dances with Wolves, actually telling my parents I was going to be an actor. There's these kind of things, you know. I just did it with this movie called Black and White. I paid for it because no one wanted to make it. I think it will be an important movie. Um, but you know, you know, what have, I've risked. I've risked my health. I've risked all my wealth. I've risked things to do things. But I never felt like it was what somebody risked in Iraq or Vietnam or Afghanistan. So, you know, I, I've always tried to be calculated about what I've done. But I have, I have, I have. I have pushed it all out there three or four times in a way I don't think most people would. Well, congratulations. You've had such a great year, and it looks like it's going to keep going. So thank you. Great interview, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, he's he's really cool, and you can tell by the way he answers. He's just, you know, he seems like a normal guy. In fact, there's a great moment here at the Four Seasons, and uh, 
in L.A. where I was uh, waiting on the elevator, and he came up to, uh, you know, uh, say goodbye to his kids. And, you know, it's just a really sweet moment. You can just you can just kind of tell, uh, I guess, on camera and off camera that he seems to, seems to be uh, pretty comfortable in, his, in what's going on in his life right now and, and uh, just seems very happy, so it's cool. I thought one of the uh, interesting things, and it actually to a certain extent made me giggle, you know, with uh, Dennis Leary, who plays the uh, head coach, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, he and, and Kevin Cosner, who plays Sonny Weaver, of course, the, the GM of the Browns, are kind of butting heads on, you know, what players they want, what players to take, you know, um, Leary wants his own, his own certain players to play certain things to run his offense, and you know, Leary in the movie comes from. Uh, he was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and you yeah. know he he uh, he tells them and at one point that the you know the Cowboys are about winning championships, and he pushes his fist out there with his with the Super Bowl ring, and and I'm just saying that it kind of made me giggle because it's been so long since we've seen a Super Bowl <laughs> around here. So it kind of made me uh, kind of made me giggle a little bit when he did that. Yeah, but it still shows that that people still feel like the Cowboys are a recognizable enough name, and they're still America's team. So it was kind of a cool nod to the Cowboys. Yeah, there's no doubt. Did you did you get a chance to to talk to Leary at all while you're out there? No, he wasn't out there, and uh, but I did get to also talk to uh, Jennifer Garner mm-hmm. and Terry Crews. And uh, Arian Foster from the Texans, so it was a really, you know, it, it was it was a good time. Well, I tell you, like I said, I, I had the opportunity to to actually go see the movie yesterday. Um, I had actually been waiting for the movie to come out because I thought it was something I'd be really interested in. And and like I said, I think Cosner did an incredible job. You know, Jennifer Garner, who she basically plays the uh, the person who handles the salary cap, and you know, so she's balancing numbers crunching numbers and uh she's also Cosner's girlfriend in the in the movie so Kevin didn't do a bad job there either with uh with Jennifer Garner but um what um was there anything was there anything big that you took out of the movie from a from a personal standpoint hmm. I, you know I think the the biggest thing for me was just sort of understanding how that stuff works I mean I'm a uh, a football fan in a sense, but I don't understand how that thing works, you know, how the how the draft works in exactly the way that it does. I mean, I understand the draft, the draft picks, but, you know, I didn't realize the kind of behind-the-scenes uh, really chess match that it really is where they're calling each other at the last second and making deals, and uh, it's it's a lot more – chaotic and, and hectic than I thought it was and requires a lot more, uh, you know, skill than, um, you know, just they just uh, casually t- laying out who you might want and what you might want to do to get them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, it, it like I said, the, the movie gives you, for anybody out there who's thinking about going to see this movie, it really gives you a back-end idea, you know, the back room, the war room kind of an idea, the things that they go through. From a scouting to you know a point pick and you know where we see this every year you know we see teams that everybody thinks are going to take a certain player and they go completely off the radar and pick somebody completely different and we see that all the time I mean we've seen it a few times here in Dallas we've you know seen a few surprises we've seen some you know we've seen some excellent jobs you know with Jerry's traded up and you know, done some good things like he did a few years ago with getting Des Bryant, which, you know, I think is uh, we saw last year is going to turn out to be a, a great pick for the uh, for the Cowboys as he continues to grow in the, in the uh, Cowboy offense. Uh, Paul, yeah, I, I want to – no, go ahead. Mm-hmm. I was going to say I think that's a, that's a great thing is to be able to see the behind the scenes because if you think about it in sports, you know, just as sports fans, when you watch any kind of game, you don't get all that much insight, any kind of – player interview before or after the game or anything with the coach they're just sound bites and they're all pretty much saying the same thing oh we tried but you know we need to whatever it is you know we, we weren't at 100 percent. you know there's a lot of that same filler stuff and anytime you can but what you'd really like to know is what they're saying underneath the helmets 
you know, on the field or when they go back in the locker room. So anything that gives you any kind of insight as to what happens, I like it. Hey, Paul, we want to thank you for, for getting up early this morning and, and calling in and uh, giving us your insight on this on this interview. Thanks for the interview. We look forward to seeing you back in Dallas, buddy. Looking forward to being back. I'll be back today. Thank you so much. All right. And that was the coolest guy in Dallas, Paul Salfin, calling from L.A., uh, talking about Draft Day. It's a movie that I highly recommend uh, that you go see if you're if you're a football fan. You you give it two thumbs up. I give it two. Th- I give it two big toes up. Hey, you heard it from the doc. All right. So two thumbs up, two big toes up. Excellent movie. Highly recommend it. All right. We're going to go to break here. We're going to go to our last break. And when we come back, we have absolutely no idea what we're going to do. <laughs> but we're going to have a little fun right here on the A and E Show on eleven ninety KFXR. You're tuned in to the Automotive News and Entertainment Show, right here on 1190 AM. Welcome back to the A&E Show right here on 1190 KFXR. We're going to do a little sports segment here, and this segment is brought to you by DodgeCityMcKinney.net. Check them out online, DodgeCityMcKinney.net. Right now, we want to talk about some of our local sports teams and their playoff push. The Dallas Stars last night. Yeah. and I know Joel, you saw the saw the game. Uh, the Stars beat the St. Louis Blues three nothing. Uh, they did. It was a great game. They 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 were focused. They wanted it. It was it was almost a chess match during the first period. Second period and third period, they came out just dominated. So chess match. That's a nice little analogy Thank there you. for a hockey game. Yeah, I just yeah. Are they smart enough to uh, play chess? Oh yeah, hockey players are smart, man. That's good. A lot of them are European. That's what they do. Uh, so all Europeans are smart. Most of them. <laughs> That's sure. good. I don't know. That's good. <laughs> and uh, well, and so they're locked into the uh, number eight seed. Right. They're gonna get the eight. They're in the eight seed. They can't move up. Or obviously, can't move down. So, and they're. It's looking like they're gonna play Anaheim in the first round, which is a little scary. But they've beaten them before. They shut them out out in Anaheim with the backup goalie. The Stars had their backup goalie. So. So well, and I uh, know just a few weeks ago it was. I mean, it wasn't wasn't looking real good for them. So they've they've yeah. had a real good push. They've gotten hot at the right. I think they've gotten hot and healthy. Yes. At the right time to uh, for the for the playoff. Yeah, push. It's been so. six years since they've six made years. the playoffs. Yep, six years. So looking deal. forward looking forward to that. And then of course we have our little Mavericks, the Dallas Mavericks, who are trying to lock up a playoff spot. Uh, right now it's between. You have the Phoenix Suns, the Dallas Mavericks, and the Memphis Grizzlies all fighting for the seventh and eighth spot. And the odd thing about the way this falls, I mean, basically the playoffs are starting now. The Mavericks play the Suns tonight, yep, and then they uh, and then they play the Grizzlies next week. If they technically, if they beat the Suns tonight, they're in. Uh, because then the Suns and the Grizzlies have to play each other, and somebody has to lose that game. So uh, we need to get uh, everybody get on the Mavericks bandwagon tonight, and let's go ahead and get them in the playoffs. How about Dirt too? Yeah, number ten, tenth, tenth, tenth all, all time. time, past Big O. Man, he's rocking, dude. Well, and that's a you know, and that's an interesting thing because I was looking at that the other day, and uh, I was um, I was talking to some people about you know how far do you think how far do you think he can climb in that you know how many years does he have left. I mean, he brought his shooting coach over from from Germany, yeah. and ever since then, I mean, he has absolutely been been on fire. And I don't know why the Mavericks just don't hire that guy and just put him on the <laughs> payroll and let him work with everybody because every time Dirk's in his history and his career, if he's gone into some kind of a slump or what have you, and his coach comes over, I mean, all of a sudden he turns it right around. I mean, the guy is the guy is unbelievable. Yeah. Hey, I'll I'll tell you, Dirk is just a phenom of an athlete, seven foot two, um, can handle the rock like most point guards, uh, hit the three, play down low if he needs to. I know there was a time period that they everybody questioned his physical ability, but he, he he's, he's a stud, yeah. just bottom line. Oh, yeah. And he, he won the championship a few years ago. Yeah, he did. Put it on his back. Yeah. Jor- Jordan-esque. Yeah. <laughs> He had some help, but it was majority it was him. I mean, that, that game clinching, or the, the finals clinching game, he he didn't do anything. Right. Yeah, he had right. A ba- that was a bad game for him. When yeah. He, when they won the championship, everyone else, the supporting cast stepped up. Like Terry, Kid, all of them. 
You know, leaders though on on the court or on the field or where wherever you're playing, leaders can do that. Whether they if they have an off game, they can pick up their whole team and and just come in. It's all a, a mindset, oh, yeah. and that goes for any sports. That goes for any business too. Well, and, you know, you got to think back to when Dirk was drafted, and I mean, you know, a for for you know the masses for the general population around here. I mean, you you have this you have this first round draft pick, eighteen year old kid. Out of Germany. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously nobody in, you know, only people in the know knew how good this guy was because it came down for the Mavericks. It was between him and Paul Pierce. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Paul Pierce was, you know, uh, I mean, Paul's had a great, he's had a great, uh, a great uh, career as well. You know, he's won an NBA championship with, uh, with Boston. And, um, but, you know, you're looking at Dirk, you know, just cracked the top 10. He's, he's 10th right now. He's a little, little over 200 points away from uh, passing Akeem Olajuwon, yep. and then next on the list would be Elvin Hayes, Moses Malone. Uh, you know, you have Shaq up there, and and then you have Wilt. Which, I mean, there's a pretty big jump from where Dirk is to to where Wilt is. Could but, you imagine if Shaq hit his free throws where he would be? <laughs> oh, he well, and Shaq's number six. I mean, when you think about the fact that the guy couldn't. Couldn't hit a barn when it came to shooting free throws. <laughs> right. I mean, there, you know, there's an that guy could have been. I mean, he'd definitely be in the. Well, you got he's three thousand points behind Wilt for fifth place. So right. I mean, there's still a huge gap. That's but, a lot of free throws. Yeah, hey, that that, that, that would be yeah. that would be a lot of free throws. And and him, unlike Dirk, Dirk does shoot free throws. That you know he's. <laughs> Uh, he usually, was a ninety percent or one. Yeah, he's usually sniffing ninety yeah. percent. So he's one of the better yeah. free throw Second shooters. Second best in the league a, right now. Which is amazing for a guy who's seven feet tall. I mean, you just don't see guys that are that are that tall that can that can you shoot know, free throws. Yeah, you know, that's something I just don't get. Right? Here's these guys, right? They're professional ball players, and they can't hit three throws. It just well, it's called a free throw. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> a three throw is a um, it's, it's the game that you normally yeah. play out in the backyard. Hey, well, I'm surfing apps <laughs> right now, all right? But this just hit me. All right? It, it just doesn't make any sense. How in the world – these are the best of the best of the best. And, now, you know, watching the tournament play, right? So here you got these hot dog kids that are obviously going to the NBA that are shooting at 50%. Kentucky. Well, it makes yeah, – exactly – Makes no sense. Well, it, it Coach, does. Put but them on the line, as, and you do a hundred, and when you make ninety of them, you get to go home. As you know, I I am a self proclaimed uh, great uh, youth basketball coach. Played the game. It's all in the legs, and and that's what makes it so great for Dirk. Though is that I mean he, a lot of wear and tear, a lot of running. He, like I said, he's handled the rock. He shoots the threes. He plays down low. I mean, he he does just about everything on the court you can ask of a ball player. And when you get down to a free throw, yeah, you're you're it, you, you don't have anybody in your face, but it comes down to your legs, and your legs are tired, and well, and you just suck it up. You you have the perfect form, have the perfect touch, but it comes down to your legs. And when people miss the free throws. There, it's you. You watch, and they don't bend down, and that's what uh, Shaq never did. He, he, it was just that straight shot. Well, you know? it just doesn't make any sense. Maybe. Didn't Larry Bird or something like that state at one time that he that's what he would do for a day out of his practice routine is do nothing but shoot that. I, well, I had. And a, I've heard of things. I've heard yeah. of things about some of these guys that literally their hands are so big. That they have a hard time getting that getting that rotation on the ball, you know, from a shot that's outside mm-hmm. of five feet. Um, but you know, I mean, it's you're. I mean, you're right. But I mean, the guys are they're so good at other things. I mean, obviously they're gonna they're gonna make mm-hmm. the league. But Dirk, Dirk I mean, will shoot a hundred free throws and and not stop until he makes a hundred in a row. Yeah. I we're, mean, that's that's the fact. We're talking right. about you know pr- shooting a hundred free throws after practice every day. That's what Dirk did. Right. Well, his first, right. him and him and Steve Nash when they came in the yeah. league after practice, all they did was shoot free throws. They they were gym rats. Yeah, I mean that they lived, you know, everything in the gym. That's that, what they that, would rather that's do. The thing and you know, early in sense. Dirk's career, early in Dirk's career, I mean, he didn't live at the free throw line, but he no. still he still shot Outside those in game. practice. I mean, early in his career, I mean, he was really just an. Just an outside player. Right. I mean, now you know as he's as he's grown and as he's developed, and and it's it's kind of weird because his development is 
is really completely different from what most big men would have. Mm-hmm. You, you'll see guys who, you know, they come out of college or like Dirk, I mean, 18 years old coming in the league, they'll come out and they have that inside game and they play that inside game. And then, you know, over time you'll start to see them, maybe they develop a 12 foot shot. And then, you know, then you get the, as they get older, they want to start shooting threes and, and Dirk's, Dirk's deal has been the the exact opposite. I mean, he was really an outside player, you know, uh, uh, shooting this thing up, and he's just amazing. He's he is really he's got to be one of the all time hardest players to defend that you you know that you've ever seen. Yeah, so absolutely. anyway, congratulations to Dirk for being the top ten. I'm sure he's going to get up, you know, probably seven or eight by the time his career is over. So congratulations to him. Uh, right now, it is time for us to cut out. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Paul Salfin for calling in from L.A., the coolest guy in Dallas. Once again, we look forward to seeing you back. Joel the Gorilla, thank you for joining us. Shu, the guru Josh Deaton, the spin doctor James Schaefer. I'm Doc. This is the A&E Show. Don't forget to check us out online at the A&E Show.com. Check us out on Twitter. Send us your tweets. Send us your ideas. Send us your points of conversation. Anything that you want to talk about, send it over to us, and we'll talk about it. Right here on the A&E Show on 1190 KFXR. We'll see you next week.